little device is going to go away. But it's not going away. Go away. OK, now it's gone away. All right, we um, are at Nicoria, Unit 4-1. Uh, this is the reconstruction of Unit 4-1 in Phase 2 with its additional veranda. Um, it's, it's nice little porch, a holdover from phase one, it's side door, it's main door, uh, the, the probable window over the front so that there would be a little bit more light coming in. We talked about um, cattle last time, right? That was the thing that we ended up with where uh, we had the nice picture of the cows and I told you about the butchering profile of the bones and how... Um, 40% of the faunal remains, the bone remains, at Nicoria were, uh, were cattle. And of those, there was a predominance of younger animals. And you all correctly deduced from that 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 suggested that animals were being killed off earlier, more likely for food. So that a, a significant aspect of the subsistence strategy, how these people survived, was by uh, raising cows for meat, as opposed to using cows for labor, for agriculture. And a reflection of that is in the kinds of implements used for cooking, found in Unit 4.1, and not just at Unit 4.1, but in other of the structures at Nicoria. Uh, in addition to cooking pots were, were these little hibachi-like arrangements where you can just imagine souvlaki out your, out the wazoo, lots, lots, lots of meat on, on spits to uh, be eaten. Ah, yeah, here we go. There, there are the cows, um, the cows and, and the cattle bones. All right. The floors of Unit 4-1 were pretty clean. Uh, they were dirt it was a dirt floor in both phases, and it was pretty clean. It was clearly kept clean. And the archaeologists recovered almost all of the finds that came from Unit 4-1 along the edges of the room. So people had swept it and kept it tidy, um, which was nice for them and not so nice for the archaeologists because that meant that there were less things to find. And what that tells us is that the objects that were found on the sides of the room were debris and probably much of what had been part of the, the accoutrement of the people who lived there, the things that they had, were, were gone. Nonetheless, in all of the structures at Nicoria and in Unit 4-1, um, there were enough things found that I inside that, that both a comparison between Unit 4-1 and the other structures could be made and the sorts of activities that occurred could be derived. And uh, one very noticeable um, aspect of the finds from Unit 4-1 was that essentially all the metal finds from the site, not 100%, but very largely, come from Unit 4-1. Now, the remains that we have are, are rather pathetic, needles and, um, and little pins and some, some rings and earrings, a, a sort of stick pin. One bent piece of gold, the only piece of gold found at the site. And all of that brings out a point um, made very intelligently by uh, somebody sitting around there in the middle of the room a couple of weeks ago, which is that wealth is relative. So while none of this might seem impressive compared to other sites and things that we've seen elsewhere, relatively speaking, Unit 4-1 is clearly the place where the wealthiest person at Nicoria lived. Inside Unit 4-1 were also a bunch of these weird little devices. They are spindle whirls. Uh, they're very, very light, each one of them. They are about 8 grams each. There were 11 found altogether, 11 spindle whirls found altogether. Uh, this is how a spindle whirl works. Um, it goes on the end of, uh, of a spindle, a, a, a stick. All fans of Rumpelstiltskin will know what a spindle is. 
And uh, here you see one in action. And it is the way that you spin wool or any kind of, on, uh, of processed fiber, flax, for example, um, into, into yarn so that you can weave something with it. Um, and here this lady is demonstrating how, how that works. And so what this tells you is that uh, there was a certain amount of textile manufacture must have been going on inside Unit 4.1. And, that, and uh, that would explain the sheep bones that were also found both in Unit 4.1 and, and elsewhere. So when I told you 40% of the fauna were cattle, that leaves 60% for other things and a significant part of the, uh, the remainder of the fauna were, sh were, were sheep. Um, of that, of those faunal remains found in Unit 4.1, 20% of them were these. These are ankle bones from sheep. And they are called by their Greek and Latin name astragaloi. If you have one, it's an astragalus. And if you've got a bunch, as there were from Nicoria, these beautiful color shots are not the ones from Nicoria. Um, they, the, old fuzzy black and white photos were just not glamorous enough for me. So um, I have these. But, the, but these are astragaloi like, uh, like the ones that were found at Nicoria. Gee, what a useless thing, an astragalus. An, a sheep ankle bone. Like, uh, why? What, what do you do with a sheep ankle bone? Well, in Greek antiquity, later Greek antiquity, that is to say in the, in the sixth and the fifth and and, and downward those centuries, astragaloi uh, were used for two things. One, as a kind of dice or gaming piece, and two, as a part of a votive offering, an offering to a deity. And these people who look like they're participating in some kind of coven <laughs> inside this big cave. These folks are standing inside um, a huge natural cave near the Greek sanctuary site of Delphi. That's the place where the Delphic Oracle near uh, the, the, this cave is near the place where the Delphic Oracle was. And uh, inside this cave, which was uh, a site of worship in Greek antiquity, French archaeologists excavating here found 24,000 astragaloi. So astragaloi were, were part of offerings to deities, and they were something that was used sometimes by priests or priestesses in a sort of oracular activity that <laughs> is called a stragalomancy, which means doing prophecy with a stragaloi. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you, you don't really need, need to know how to spell that word. Um, but it, but uh, um, so in the same way that, that you could use them as dice, to, it, you would throw them, and depending on what side they landed on, it, 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 would, uh, it would mean something. Likewise, also in a stragalomancy, you would throw them, and then how the astragaloi fell would tell you something about um, what was going to happen. So uh, here you see um, uh, a sixth century plaque uh, from, um, from Corinth that, that shows a family uh, offering up a sheep for animal sacrifice. And here's the altar. Um, and then the family is processing. And so you can imagine the sheep's ankle bones uh, then being removed after the, after the animal has been killed for sacrifice um, to be offered um, or used in, in part of the cult ritual. Uh, the astragaloi, the 20% of the faunal remains from Nicoria Unit 4.1, um, that were astragaloi were found in a heap by this stone circle.
And on the top of the circle was a 60 centimeter deep residue of burnt soil and ash, indicating that there had been, uh, there had been fire, that it was the base for, for a fire. Perhaps this stone circle reminds you of another very um, regularly occurring large hearth. This is um, from the, the Megarana Pylos. All right. What is this building? What is unit 4-1? You've got a lot of information now about this unit, most of which I gave you last time, some additional that I've given you here. What is the function of unit 4-1? It might be domestic. It might be a kind of administrative building. It might be some kind of a temple or ceremonial building. Come up with a couple of pieces of evidence each for all three of those. Speak to one another. Go. Domestic, administrative, ceremonial. Sixty percent courseware, forty percent fineware. That's what I told you. Um, <laughs> okay, ready? Got something for everything? Luckily, I'm not going to be calling on you. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be right <laughs> All right. Professor, I didn't get the question. Is that, is that on the internet? Yeah, it is on the internet. Okay. And you should um, tackle Dan before he takes off. And okay. he should have extras, too. Um, but yeah, it's on the, it's on the, on the course website. All right. Sir. So the astragaloid, the sheep ankle bones, suggests that a uh, function of unit 4-1 is ceremonial. So an administrative role is suggested by the fact that it looks to be the place where all the wealth of the community is stashed. It could be domestic because there's a bunch of 
fauna of the sort that suggests that people ate there. The spindle whorls, which are very homey and s clearly indicate that people were, uh, some people were spending some time in their spinning, which doesn't seem too fancy. So another reason that the that the all of the goods, all of the wealthy stuff is here is not because this is some sort of administrative redistribution center, but because this person who lives in this house is the big the big gun, the sort of this the sort of chief, and and he is either the big chief because he's the wealthiest, or he or 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 the other way around. But anyway, that it's not administrative so much as position. The position of the house and the size of the house, it's the centrally located structure and it is the largest structure. And what is one of the reasons it's the largest structure? What's back here? Storage pits, right, in the back. Just a, just a general meeting house and, and not, not necessarily where any individual lived, but a sort of community hall. So the two, uh, so based on the evidence that we've got here, um, either we need to conclude that it is in essence a domicile, but for somebody who is that much more important and central and powerful and wealthy than everybody else in the community. And if we don't, if we have a hard time believing that, as, as you say, then we have to say that nobody actually lived here, that it was just this sort of community, community hall. Who, who was in charge, though, of, of the community, if that's the case? I mean, it's not, you know, it's not even as if there's a single access. There's a side door, which uh, allows people in here to go in and out without having to do the, the, the frontal approach and the waiting around in the veranda area. Other evidence for any of the any of the functions, domestic <coughs> or ceremonial or administrative. Yeah. The courtyard. The courtyard is uh, suggests administrative or or possibly ceremonial because it's very elegant, or relatively speaking, it's elegant, and it and it allows for people to gather, and it even allows for people to gather protected, somewhat from from the elements. Um, because even in the first phase, there is this veranda uh, and, and a kind of porch um, ov over it. What about the pottery? Most of the pottery found in there was courseware. Mm -hmm. A lot of cooking vessels, a lot of sort of daily life what you need stuff that suggests domestic on the other hand the amount of fineware which I put in quotes because it's so darn ugly it's hard to think of it as fineware but you know relatively speaking the amount of fineware here is proportionately more than at inside any of the other individual structures at Nicoria other reasons for one or another
Okay, what is Unifor 1? A house. The house of the big man. Raise your hand. Not very many of you. Just a few. What is Unifor 1? An administrative center. Few more. About a quarter of you. What is for one a ceremonial building? What is unit for one all of the above? What is a building like that? An all of the above sort of building. Say it louder. Yeah. Oops. Administrative? Absolutely. Tablets. Ceremonial? Absolutely. Hearth, all those drinking cups. Domestic? Absolutely. All of the rooms along the sides, all of the living quarters on the edges, all rolled into one, a person who functioned as the, intermediary, the representative and the intermediary for the people who live in the surrounding area. That person was the let's call him the king. There is evidence of religious life in Mycenaean citadels, but the most important place is this place, not the small shrines on the down, down slopes and on the outskirts. The Megaron at the highest point, the biggest building with the, the most internal fittings, that functioned as not only a domestic space, not only as administrative space, but the main ceremonial space for the community, meaning that the person who was in charge here, the king who was in charge here, functioned as the main sort of cosmic representative of the community. In that regard, Nicoria looks to be a place where some of the peoples who remain after the Mycenaean collapse move to. That in its very small, much, much poorer way, it is a last gasp of the old idea. So now we've seen Nicoria, and we've seen Lefkandi at two ends of Greece. And now we're going to go to Athens. Here's an awesome satellite view showing the situation. Here's the situation of the city. It's in a large plain on the edge of the Saronic Gulf, so very close to the water, ringed by uh, mountains. And in the middle of the plain, there are a couple of uh, sort of big bedrock outcrops. And one of those is the Acropolis, which is right here. And here's another one of those big bedrock outcrops. And in the distance, you can see some of the, some of the mountains that, that ring the plain, the Athenian plain. You probably read, or some of you probably read in your course pack about the Acropolis being one of the nine Mycenaean citadels. Uh, here's some of the evidence for that. So obviously there's the Parthenon. Uh, and in front of the Parthenon, down here, this is actually, look, for those of you that have ever been to Athens, this is a picture taken from the, the roof of the Temple of Athena Niki. Um, which is right there on the edge of the Acropolis. So looking down about here on the Acropolis, you can see part of the Mycenaean Cyclopean wall of, of the Acropolis. Um, 
So the Acropolis was the citadel of a Mycenaean palatial compound, like Pylos and Mycenae and Tiryns. And down below the Acropolis, in this flat-lying area um, to, its, to its north, and again, you can see the great plain of the city of Athens with the, with the, uh, with the mountains around it. So down here in this flat-lying area to the north of the Acropolis was a huge burial ground. And in this burial ground, we can trace the development of the society the societies who lived in Athens from the Mycenaean period all through um, sub-Mycenaean proto-geometric and geometric eras and down into the classical periods. In the Mycenaean era, uh, chamber tombs with multiple burials, lots of wealthy stuff like, uh, like these gold discs, figurines recognizable to you, phi and psi figurines, uh, show that Mycenaean Athens was in step with and its kings had access to the same sorts of goods that uh, the rulers of other Mycenaean citadels had. Athens is, according to the burial evidence that we have, never, um, never abandoned. It's continuously occupied. The citadel is damaged. The Megaron disappears. But the city is not abandoned, or the site, I should say, at this point, the village. There, people continue to live there. And how do we know? We know from burial. So here, for example, uh, cyst grave, stone line cyst grave um, of uh, an inhumation of a single male. What's the date? You guys are very sleepy today. What's the date? Give me a style. What's the style of this pot? Yeah, you. It's not early Hellenic. Early Hellenic would be Bronze Age. <laughs> What did you say? What are you going to say? I got some votes for early geometric. You were like, yeah, OK, fine. <laughs> early geometric, everybody agrees with that? Even though it's got this little squiggle line? Squiggles, swirlies, whirlies are not geometric. <laughs> Cyst grave, inhumation, bunches of finds, including metal. What's the date? I got to vote for early geometric. What is the characteristic of an early geometric pot? It's almost all painted. So this can't be that. <laughs> Proto-geometric. Um, uh, 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 in the sub-Mycenaean period, I forgot to tell you this. I'll go back. In the sub-Mycenaean period, 83 graves have been found uh, in the city of Athens. And most of the graves are quite poor. They just have a single or a couple pots. There are no metal finds. 71% of those graves are without any metal finds. Does that give a question? I said 83 graves. 83 graves, 71% of them without metal. In the proto-geometric period, there are um, 76 graves been found so far, 76 graves. So I mean, obviously, 
this cannot be the entire population of the city, but so far that's, that's what's been found in excavation. And 75% of them have metal finds in the graves. What, what other graves have we seen of this period? What other graves have we seen of this period? Oh, you guys. You need to like do some sort of cattle prod thing when you walk into the room. <clears throat> so that you like all wake up and you're paying attention. All right. What other graves of this period have we seen? Not in Athens, elsewhere. Somebody back there. Which graves? Thanks. You know something, you guys? You are not going to be able to follow so well as we start to move along in the, today's lecture, next week's lecture, and so on, if you don't have some kind of framework that you're building up in your head. You have to start charting this stuff out. Make a little grid. Sites across the top, centuries down the side. So 10th century, what's happening at Lefkandi? What's happening at Nicoria? What's happening in Athens? And you just fill something in in the box because we're gonna, we're gonna get a couple more sites. We're gonna have 9th century, we're gonna have 8th century, we're gonna have 7th century, and you're going to have to start comparing things across centuries and across places. You're not gonna be able to do it unless this stuff starts to fit into some larger framework. All right, so uh, tombs one and three at Left Kandi, did they have metal finds? Yes, they did. Um, so uh, this suggests some semblance of prosperity returning, or it suggests something else. What else might that suggest that you go from 70 some odd percent of the grades without metal fines to 70 some odd percent of the grades with metal fines? What is another possible explanation? An increase of wealth is one explanation, and what is another explanation? I'm not calling on you. <laughs> and I'm not calling on you. <laughs> Somebody back there. You guys are just coasting on the tails of these people down here in the front. You gotta stop doing that. They're gonna stop talking to you. Okay. They're getting medals from somewhere else. Well, so so it, it, your explanation is is a is a corollary of theirs, more wealth or more access, more access. I'm thinking of an explanation that might have to do with the population at large. We have about the same number of graves that, you know, that we, that, that we have so far. Well, there's no, we have, we have about the same number of graves from the in sub-Mycenaean and proto-geometric. And in, but we have only 25% of the graves have metal in sub-Mycenaean, and now only 25% of the graves don't have metal in um, proto-geometric. Zach? There are less poor people? Saying that there are less poor people in a way is saying that more people are, 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 are rich, you know, that, that more of the population is rich. Hmm? Um, they, um, like, 
So all of these explanations take as a given that everybody is buried in a grave like this. But another possible explanation is that burial itself, this kind of formal burial with grave goods, becomes itself an emblem of the wealthy. So it's not that there are, it's not that poor people move away exactly, as was suggested down here, is that we might not have as many poor people's graves. That is, that burial, which was something that in the 11th century more people had, in the 10th century, the act of a formal burial with grave goods signifies the wealthier class. Well, we, it's, it's very misleading to talk about the number of graves per se because I, this is a sample from the burials in this one area uh, north of the Acropolis in, in the city of Athens, these particular numbers. Ah, thank you. Um, any indication of whether the population itself is getting bigger? The uh, evidence suggests that at this time the population is not getting bigger, but in another century it is, and the evidence are wells, wells that are dug. And there are more wells that are dug in the succeeding um, 9th and 8th centuries than in the 10th century. So that suggests that, that by then the population is in, in fact increasing, but it, there's no evidence on the ground for the population to be increasing right now. All right. Um, those were inhumations, cis burials, inhumations. And in the, uh, in the ninth century, we start to get both inhumations and cremations. And here you see um, uh, an excavator uh, discovering the top of, and here it is um, partially uncovered, a cremation burial. The burial would, was, in, the ashes were inside this vessel. And here is a drawing of it as it was. So there was uh, originally a large stone on the top and then stones covered the entirety of it. And there were lots of goods stuck down in the burial pit, which was invisible that is unmarked on the surface. And here's the, here's the amphora that, uh, that was inside the burial pit. And you see that this is how it was found, with a bronze sword wrapped around the shoulder of the amphora. You can read about this burial in uh, John Camp's Athenian Agora, which is in your course pack. Uh, so it's early geometric, which I know you would have all recognized because the vase is practically all black with just a single uh, little band and one little panel of geometric designs. Yep. Um, in terms of art, how do you guys know where to dig? The, uh, the entirety of this area was originally a cemetery, and every place that you go down far enough, you find graves. So, so in a given excavation plot in, uh, in this zone north of the, of the Agora, Whenever the, um, the archaeologists who are working here get a permit for a specific block, they just go down as far as they can. When they get all the way down to ground level, they find graves. Here are um, the rest of the, iron, the, uh, the metal, the iron uh, finds that come from this burial. An axe, a knife, a chisel, a pin, a fibula, you remember that a fibula is a, uh, is a kind of safety pin. Two spearheads, 
So that's an addition to the sword that was wrapped around the, uh, the burial. And bridal fragments, fragments from a, from a bridal. Not too far away from that burial, which we assume to be of a man. We can't tell for sure because it's a cremation, so we don't have the actual bones. Um, but we assume it on the basis of the finds that go with the burial, which um, are weaponry and, and related to horsemanship. Was this uh, cremation burial also underground? A deep, uh, a deep pit with a large, a large vase, and you see it being um, partially uncovered there. And here is the, um, the amphora that was the burial jar itself. What's the date? What century? Give me a century. <laughs> Give me a century. Yeah. Oh. Ninth, ninth or eighth. That, that, it would be hard to go wrong with that. Ninth or eighth. Um, it's it's uh, dated by the archaeologists uh, from the Athenian Agora as ninth, probably late ninth um, century BC. Uh, they are both amphoras. We know that this one is uh, the burial of a man. And uh, as you'll see in a moment, this one is almost certainly the burial of a woman. We deduce that from the finds. And, you, and in Athens, in this period, burials of men and women were differentiated, cremation burials, by the sort of amphora that people were buried with. So male burials had amphoras with the handles coming off of the neck, and female burials had amphoras with the handles on the belly. These are called neck amphoras, and these are called belly amphoras. And uh, belly amphoras are always for, for female burials, and neck amphoras for, for male burials. In the uh, burial pit next to the woman's amph uh, amphora were 50 pots, a faience necklace with, uh, with a faience bead, a large central bead and then small faience beads all the way around, and a remarkable, amazing pair of solid gold earrings that have fashioned on the bottoms little pomegranates. Here's some, some real pomegranates to show you what they look like. And uh, here's a nice young lady wearing a reproduction of these earrings, um, not the real ones, so that you can see how dazzling they are and fancy and big, just incredible. Where would the know-how, to say nothing of the materials of this, have come from in this period? They come from the east. In the ninth century, the big imperial force in, uh, in this world was the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian, the Assyrian Empire whose uh, heartland was uh, Mesopotamia, mo mostly modern day Iraq, also had expanded by this time to include parts of Turkey, parts of modern day Turkey and Syria and uh, Lebanon and Israel and, and also Egypt. And at the capital of the Assyrian Empire, Nimrud, in, uh, in modern day northern Iraq in, in Kurdistan, some unrobbed royal graves were found dating from the uh, 9th century BCE, and, or the 8th century BCE, sorry. And here are some of the gold objects that come from those graves. And it's easy to see right away uh, the, that the workmanship and the material for these dazzling earrings um, are their homeland at this, at this period, must, must be the East. And the earrings themselves must have come to Greece already made. That is, whoever, um, whoever got these. It wasn't a traveling craftsperson with ingots of gold in his pocket but that the earrings themselves already crafted must have been acquired by the family whose uh, matriarch was buried in this, in this grave. Here are some of the other pots from uh, the 
this, this grave, so some of the 50 vessels, um, household vessels, a pitcher and a cup and a smaller amphora, and a kind of vessel that's called a pyxis, P-Y-X-I-S. A pyxis is a pot uh, that is a, is a, is a lidded box. So it's, you could use it as a jewelry box or, a, or you know, it's just a small decorated box. Um, so this lid comes off and then you, you could put things on the inside. And this completely bizarre and unique pyxis, which looks to be a terracotta rendition of uh, silos or granaries. And each of the little uh, egg-shaped pyxis tops has an opening, a silo or granary-like opening uh, at the top. We're going to come back to this in, in uh, well, in theory by the end of the hour. You just hold on to that thought. All right. In the, uh, in the 8th century, so those are, those are 9th century graves. In the 8th century, a new development occurs in Athens where in addition to cremation burials with uh, the remains being put inside a vessel and being buried deep below the ground, the burials have markers that stick up out of the ground. Sometimes the markers are stelae, but frequently they are vessels, large vessels, that partially are partially buried and partially stick up out of the ground to mark the position of a burial. And these vessels are very, very large, as you can see from one of them here, um, in, a, in a museum in Athens. And in addition to being very, very large, they have scenes on them. The scenes are placed in such a way that they would have been visible and above the ground surface. So all of these uh, bands of geometric decoration here, this would have been underground. And this part of the vessel sticking up. Who's buried in this? Vessel? A woman. A woman. Has to be a woman because it's, uh, it's a belly amphora. Yes? How do I spell? Scenes. S-C-E-N-E-S. -E the particular cemetery that this large amphora comes from is called the Dipolon cemetery, and uh, so it's called the Dipolon Amphora. It's late geometric instead of middle because now we've got figures, we've got a scene, we've got people. And here is what you see. There's a body lying on a bier. There's a shroud over the body, but the painter has painted this in a very strange way. He's painted it as this kind of thick T-shaped checkerboard decorated thing and stopped painting right there outlining the figure but made it clear from this part here that it's supposed to go all the way around the figure because if he painted it all the way around the figure, you wouldn't see the figure. You would just see the shroud. So you wouldn't be able to tell what was going on. So there's a shroud wrapped figure on a bier very uh, elongated one, and that must be the woman, and she's wearing a long dress, as a matter of fact, whose cremated remains were inside this amphora. On either side are people mourning. Their hands are to their heads in a schematic pose of grief. You might imagine them crying. There are children. Here, this depicted just by a difference in size. So here, this smaller figure with one hand holding the couch of the woman's beer. And even 
probably in front of, I don't think we're supposed to think of these people as underneath, but in front of the bier, you see more mourners, women in dresses, and a man seated, and what's this person doing? He, he, might, he might be, but it, then everything would be going up in flames. What's he doing? What's he doing? What do you think he's doing? Right, very good point. Doesn't have both of his hands to his head. The people whose hands are to their heads are probably crying. What's this guy? But this guy doesn't have his hands to his head, so he's not crying. Oh, no, I don't think he's happy. What? You don't have to have both hands to your head to cry, but obviously the person who's painting this wants you to know that this person is doing something different than the rest of these people. Well, well, they, I mean, but, but, but somebody painted this on purpose. They put four figures in front, three of them are actively mourning, and then there's a fourth. So what would he be doing? Talking. He'd be talking. He'd be speaking. Yeah. Maybe he's a priest, maybe he's a family member. We don't have any way to distinguish him in terms of a position, but we can distinguish him in terms of activity because the painter has deliberately asked us to distinguish him by putting his hands in a different position. So the painter purposefully is saying, this person is doing something different. This person is, is talking. And you see, I love this scene. I can't, I can't resist telling all these details. See these two, guys, these two people on the end, they're holding up the shroud. See that? Isn't that cute? Uh, the Dipolon Amphora uh, is one of a number of these magnificent, huge vases that start to show up um, there are about 20 known of these particularly large vases from this cemetery in Athens, the Dipolon Cemetery. Here's another one. The Dipolon Crater was buried up to about here under the ground so that these are the scenes that we're showing. In addition to uh, a similar scene of a person on a beer, and you see that person on a beer here, what's this? What's this a scene of? Chariots, horses and chariots. Horses and chariots, what are they doing? It's like a procession. Why do you say, a who said a procession? Why? But no, why do you, why do you call it a procession? They're, they're in a line, there's a bunch of them. Why isn't this, what, could it be a race? They're not leaning forward. Their legs are straight. Right. So all of those tell us that this is, this is more, either they're standing still or they're moving very slowly one after another, but there's no real speed going along. So that's what allows us to see that it's a kind of procession. But it's a procession of who? What, can you make out this figure here? Warriors. How do you know? Because they have shields. It's a procession of warriors because they have shields. These sorts of scenes which start to show up on these especially large amphoras and craters, these especially large vases, are called prothesis scenes. Prothesis is a Greek word that means placing before you or laying out. And the, and the, the thing that's being laid out is the, is the burial of the person. So again, here's the burial. Here's the shroud. Um, again, there's a child and uh, family members 
um, in front of and on either side. And regularly in these prothesis scenes, in addition to children and adults and a shroud, and here is a child that's actually up on the top of the, of the beer next, next to uh, this <coughs> man, there is somebody talking, like this person right here. Somebody talking. The um, prothesis scenes, let me back up for a second. The prothesis scenes um, are d maybe, I don't know, 5 or 10% of all late geometric burial pots. In other words, most don't have scenes like this. What may you infer about the burials from, of these, we can, I think, all agree, must be wealthy and important people, both men and women. What can you infer from these scenes? How, make, just make a fast list, two or three things that you can, or even, even more. That's a good one. All right. Tell me something. What can you infer? There's a lot of people involved. There's a big crowd. A lot of mourners. Something else. Next person. So, so the crowd suggests that these are ceremonies reserved for somebody who's very important. So that there are very important people and they get a big crowd of people mourning for them. Something else. Well, there's some sort of discussion or talk or story. There's something being said. There's something being told. So there's some, there, there's some program, some script. You might call it a ritual, but you might, I, I mean, a ritual just means something that's done repeatedly in a way. So, um, yes, but, but to say that it's a ritual doesn't say what it is. Um, but yes, the, it's, it's a ritual of somebody having, saying some words at, at the time of burial. Something else. Mm -mm. Person, next person that row. It's very, very elaborate. What, what is one of the components of the elaboration? The, the, the shroud. What kind of burial do you think that this is going to be? Why? Cremation? Well, anyway, I mean, we, I, I mean, as it happens, we know it's a cremation. What is being depicted on here, in all cases, is the body being wrapped up in a shroud. And where have we seen a body being wrapped up in a shroud that was cremated? Left Kundi. Other components of these of this event. Um, I had like a story where telling it says death being wealthy. They had a, they had a story. They had something to say. It's not just about wealth because if it was just about wealth. You wouldn't need somebody having. You wouldn't need somebody being depicted talking. 
because the size of the vase, the, the crowd, and everything else, all of that emphasizes wealth. So there's something in addition to that that needs to be set. Possibly. Possibly this is to indicate, right, that there were, um, that there was a sacrifice of animals in conjunction with the, with the burial. Yep. Yeah, there are family members being depicted. Family members being depicted. At the time that these are being made, um, the, these are particular vases for funerary markers. And half the vase was buried. So there wouldn't have been any point in putting figured, taking the time to put a figured decoration on the part of the vase that was underground. Um, so the, the, dec the decoration part always occurs on the part of the vase that's above ground. In the case of the Dipolon Amphora and the Dipolon Crater, they just have the, the, the two figured friezes, but, but there are other vases where there are figures all the way up, like, like this one, for example. This is the neck of the pot, and there are figures that go all the way up, but the lower part of the pot that would have been underground just. But that's because these are particularly for burial. There are other late geometric vases with scenes on them, smaller vases, and the scenes cover the whole pot. So it's, that is partially because of the, of the function. There, and another. Okay. They were, they were for the cremations. So they were filled with ashes. So the, oh, I thought the cremation, I thought that's what I thought I said it was like. Oh, 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 the, oh, I'm sorry. The Dipolon Amphora, the, the particular, the vase markers? Yeah. Yes, no, they were not filled with anything. No. I mean, yeah. They must have had some dirt in them to stabilize them. But, um, but they were not filled with anything. The lady with the earrings did not have one of these. That is a very nice question. The lady with the earrings did not have one of these. The warrior grave, the guy, the emperor that had the sword wrapped around it did not have one of these. What's the difference, thank you very much, what's the difference between burials in the 9th century in Athens and the 8th century in Athens? I'm not calling on you two. Come on, somebody, what's the difference? Somebody who has not talked. <laughs> Quick, what's the difference? They were marked. They were public. There was a public commemoration of the ceremony and ritual. All right, hold that thought. See you next time. Oh, whoops. What do I need? I need.